God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, good morning, church. We do give honor to God this morning and to all of the people of God as we come before his throne with the longing to hear his word. I want to call your attention to the book of Esther and the fourth chapter, reading from the New International Version, beginning at verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I want to speak this morning from the subject of meeting the moment. Meeting the moment. Well, here we are, the last week, the last Sunday of the year 2020. We have made it this far, and it is without necessity that we say this has been a tough year. In all my years, when I would speak to the church at the end of the year, in the beginning of the year, it was often with mixed emotions. Because as we look back on the past year, in times past, there has always been, for some people, a rather good year. People got married, children were born, people got saved, people got baptized. And so come the end of the year, they're able to look back with gladness and rejoicing. And then there were always those who suffered loss. Mom passed away. People were sick. Lost the job. Marriages dissolved. So I always had a kind of mixed audience. But this year, it's a little different because it's clear that while we 
have so much to rejoice over and be thankful for, and there were plenty of good things that did happen. By and large, we all share the idea that this has been a rough and tough, unforgettable year. And we wait to see what 2021 is going to bring us. I want to share some thoughts about the book of Esther. The book of Esther is one of the most controversial books of the entire Bible. A little known book, it's considered a historical writings for the Hebrews, but there are some scholars and non-scholars who question whether or not the book of Esther should even be in the Bible. For one, it's the only book of the Bible that does not mention the name God or Lord throughout the entire text. There's no prophet speaking. There's no reference to the Mosaic law. In fact, it could be argued that God seems to be absent in the book of Esther. Furthermore, the book of Esther is nowhere mentioned in the New Testament. It's not quoted by Jesus or any of the apostles. It's not cited, it's not listed, it's not alluded to. If we only had the New Testament, we would think that the book of Esther wasn't even there. In 1946, a discovery was made. The Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient writings found in a cave enclosed in clay jars. An archive in a library of many ancient texts dating back to some say before Jesus, at the time of Jesus, and at the time of the apostles. They're one of the oldest pieces of scripture that we have. And in this library of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are fragments of every single Old Testament scripture that we have, except the book of Esther. But Esther was nonetheless regarded as an important book for the Hebrews. In the text of Esther, we find in the ninth chapter, these days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. Esther gives the origins of an important feast for the Jews, the Feast of Purim. It's usually celebrated around February 25th and 26th. It's usually a two-day feast and celebration. Jews would come together, exchange gifts. They had special foods and pastries that were part of the festival and celebration. And during that time, they would read the book of Esther. Because the book of Esther and the Feast of Purim speak of a time when the Jews came very close to annihilation. And somehow, through the hand of God, they were spared. And so it became an important part of the Jewish history to this day. Because throughout history, of course, Israel has come close to similar events where evil attempted to annihilate them and erase them from the earth. Even to this day, the nation of Israel 
in a constant state of conflict with Islamic nations who would like to see Israel off the map. So Esther is a rather important book to the Jews because it brings them to this time of remembrance. I want to look through some of the components to the book of Esther, the story of Esther. It goes around five characters. There is King Xerxes, who is known by other names and recorded in different parts of scriptures and translations by other names. But Xerxes is one of the easiest ones, so I'm going to use that one. <laughs> then there is Queen Vashti. There is Mordecai, a person called Haman. And of course, there is Esther. Now, let's get some historical context to where we are in history at this time. We are way beyond the Babylonian captivity that we have spoken so many times about. Books of the Bible are written during that time, taking us to Ezekiel, Daniel. This takes place after the Babylonian captivity. It's the Persian Empire, led by Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great was the one who eventually took over the kingdom and the empire of Babylon. Looking at a map to get our bearings, we see here the nation of Israel. You notice that the northern kingdoms are already long gone. They were dissolved during the Assyrian captivity, leaving only the kingdom of Judah. That kingdom was eventually taken over by Babylon, where key numbers of families of Jews were carried away and dispersed throughout the lands. Now, when we think of Persia today, we are called to basically the land of Iran, which is actually a big chunk of land. That is modern day Persia. But in the ancient days, under King Cyrus, the Persian Empire was much more than that. We read, this is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. So you see here that the Persian Empire on the Cyrus and Xerxes was a massive amount of land from India all the way into Africa. And throughout this region, as Persia was the dominant force in the world, Jews were scattered and living in all parts of this land. Now, when we talk about the book of Esther, Hollywood has almost always sanitized and glamorized the story, namely with more recent one, One Night with the King. They romanticize it turn it into a sort of Cinderella tale. But in fact, the story of Esther was much darker than what you see in the Hollywood movies. First of all, a lot of it takes place in a harem. And the harem was a place where the king would have women, virgins selected based solely on their appearance and their beauty. But in the harem, they were given the best clothes, the best food. They had their hair done every two weeks. <laughs> All the Mary Kay products that they would desire. Because that's all they had to do 
was to look good and be healthy for whenever the king would call for their service. The book portrays King Xerxes as a rather interesting character. He is quite superficial. He is quite taken and impressed with all the things that he has, all the land that he rules over, all of his riches, all of his power and authority, and he spends quite a bit of time talking about it. He also is someone that doesn't seem to be able to make his own decisions. In the book of Esther, many of the decisions and edicts and judgments that this king makes is at the behest of other people's suggestions. Whether a good judgment or bad judgment, they all seem to come from somebody else other than the king himself. So the story opens up, when these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. Can you see the problem coming? For the kings instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. So the story opens up at a drunken party that is now seven days in the making. And everybody is having a good time at this party. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who serve him to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. So he calls for his queen. Now, the queen does not have any authority or power. The queen is basically someone to look at. The king's number one lady of the hour, his first choice. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Medea, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. So she is ousted from her position as queen. Now, it's interesting that for some people, Vashti is a hero, and others, she's seen as a villain. It's an interesting take throughout histories and generations on how you regard Vashti. If you were of the male chauvinist persuasion, you saw her as a villain a lesson to be taught that women are supposed to be subject to their husbands. They are to obey them. It's getting quiet in here. <laughs> and there have been those who would charge Vashti as being in the wrong because no matter what, you're supposed to obey especially your husband. Then there are those who see her as a hero because Vashti is someone who says, I'm not going to obey any immoral command. Vashti is seen as someone who holds on to her integrity and her standards 
and says, you're not going to just flaunt me and parade me through a drunken mob just because you think you should. In any case, Vashti is out. Story goes to a man by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jew, and he seems to have somewhat of a position in this kingdom. He was taken from the Babylonians, and like so many other Jews after the captivity, for whatever reason, did not return to the land of Judah, but stayed where he was, and at this time, in Persia. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadasha, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hagar. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hagar, who had charge of the harem. So Mordecai has adopted his youngest cousin, who was an orphan, and raised her as his own daughter. She's attractive and beautiful, and that was good enough to get her selected to be one of possibly hundreds of women that were sent to the harem to wait on the king's call. Now, the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. So now Esther is brought into the harem because she is beautiful, she is selected to take Vashti's place as the king's number one woman and makes her the queen. However, no one knows that she is Jewish. Then we turn to Haman. The ten sons of Haman, the sons of Amaditha, the enemy of the Jews, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Haman is called a number of times the enemy of the Jews. Several times he is mentioned as the enemy of the Jews. Now, why does Haman hate Jews? Well, there are some hints and indications to why Haman has such hostility and animosity toward Jewish people. We look at his name. He is known as the Agagite. Now, Agag was not a nation. It was not a nationality. Agag was a person. And you have to go back hundreds of years when there was a king by the name of Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a long-standing opposition and enemy to the Jews, going way back to their wilderness wandering. And when Israel came into Canaan land, the Amalekites were still an antagonistic force. When Israel got their first king, King Saul. Saul is commanded to wipe out the Amalekites and kill King Agag. Well, Saul doesn't do it. 
However, Samuel does. Samuel kills King Agag and all of the other prisoners. And so Haman, a descendant of Agag, carries this memory of what the Jews did to his ancestor and his nation. Now, King Saul, his father, was a Benjamite. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel. Kish had a son named Saul. So King Saul, the one who was commanded and instructed to kill Agag, was a Benjamite and the son of Kish. Well, it just so happens that Mordecai is also a Benjamite. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish. So here we see that Mordecai is a descendant of Saul, where Haman is a descendant of Agag. And what we have here is hundreds of years later, we're going to have a showdown between these two families. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Now, Haman not only wants to kill Mordecai and all the Jews in town, but he wants to kill all the Jews throughout the entire kingdom of Xerxes. Now, we already said that kingdom was massive. So we're not talking about a little local conflict. We're talking about the annihilation of Jews everywhere throughout the known world, throughout the kingdom. So we go to our text in the book of Esther, the fourth chapter. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned to the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So Haman is trying to kill all the Jews. And... Esther has the king's ear. So Mordecai tells her, you need to speak up on behalf of the Jewish people and get the king to stop what is about to happen. Now Esther says that if I do that without being called before the king, he's going to kill me. Now that kind of sounds reasonable. But a careful examination will tell us that Mordecai was maybe calling Esther to a challenge. That this wasn't about being killed. Why? Because think back on Queen Vashti. When Queen Vashti dishonored the king, she wasn't killed. Her punishment was that she would never again enter the presence of the king. So the question and the challenge for Esther is to examine your values. Are you afraid of being killed? Or are you afraid of losing all of your privilege? Are you afraid that you are going to be ousted and sent back to the peasants? You're going to lose all of your favor. All of the good things that come with being in your position. 
So Esther steps up. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai's challenge to Esther was to not look at the privileges and all of the niceties that are at your disposal right now, but to re-examine yourself and maybe see that all that we're going through now, you have a role to play in it. For the book of Esther, the name of God may be absent, but the hand of God is ever present. And we see this throughout the book of Esther. Just certain events and things that happen. Some people call them coincidences. And there are a series of what appears to be simple coincidences that happen throughout the story of Esther. In chapter 2, Esther happens to be selected as the new queen. Mordecai happens to overhear a plot to kill the king in one point of the story. The king happened to have insomnia one night. The king calls for the records to be read, and the king happens to recall Mordecai's report to save the king. There are these and others that just kind of happened. And when you read through the story of Esther, remove any one of these so-called coincidences and you'd have a completely different story. But there's a difference between a coincidence and providence, especially for the people of God. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. And of course, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. When we look back at this past year, many of us may say, why did this have to happen now? Why in my lifetime? Why in my neighborhood? Why with my family? Why am I living in 2020? Why couldn't I have been here much earlier and avoided this? Why couldn't God have put me somewhere in the future where this would be all in the past? So it calls us, especially toward the end of a year, to reflect, to think back on what this year was about, and how it affected us. And how did you respond to it? What did you do with the crisis that we lived through in 2020? 2020 didn't just change events. 2020 changed some people. Because there are people now that are very different than who they were back in January. Some for the better. Some not so much. There's some people that are a little more intolerant than they started the year out. There are people that are a little more angry, a little more bitter, a little more unforgiving a little more contentious, argumentative than they were at the beginning of the year. The year has had an effect on who they are, who they were. 
We all see it. The mantra for the year, especially during the lockdowns, was we're all in this together. And it sounds good, but the fact of the matter is we have never been more divided than we have been in this year. We have never been more contentious, argumentative, exclusive, and isolated than we have been this year. It's so that you don't even know who to talk to anymore. You don't know who to talk to, and you don't know what to talk about. Because we have taken sides on these issues. And we see people now as either for us or against us. You're one of us or you're one of them. This, unfortunately, has been the product, summation for so many people in this year of crisis. But the Christian faith is not about taking a side. Christian faith is about making a difference. What did you do in this year of crisis? How have you responded? The end of the year, we look back and reflect. Look back. How did I do this year? Was I at my best? Did I rise to the challenge? Or did I succumb to the tensions that we now live in? James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. At the end of the year, we want to look back on who we are. Who have we become? What things did we do? What should we have done? How did we fail? What can I do to make it right? Reflection paves the way to repentance. And so now that we are at this last Sunday of 2020, decidedly a trying year, this is a time where I, for one, want to look back, say, what could I have done better? Was I as loving and responsive as maybe I should have been? What is our responsibility in times of crisis? Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's how we're supposed to be in times of crisis. When you're in darkness, you want someone who has a light. You want someone who's able to show you a way through. And that should be our challenge in these last days of the year. Lord, if I failed, search my heart, examine my life, show me how to make a difference. Maybe I didn't do everything right this year, but don't let me carry it into the next year. Let me be the light that you called me to be. I'm not going to carry my bitterness into next year. I'm not going to carry my anger into next year. I'm not going to take this unforgiveness with me into this next year. I'm here to lay it at the altar and say, Lord, search my heart. If you find anything that's not pleasing to you, move it according to your grace. Make me a bright light in a dark world. Use me to reach out to somebody and let them know that God is a God of love and that no matter how bad things are, God is still with us, that God will bring us through. Let my life 
be a reflection of that. Let me rise to the occasion. Let me meet the moment and be what God has called me to be. If you love the Lord, give him a praise. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he 